Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming and uh, listening to my talk. And uh, my name is Michal Hrušecký, and I will be talking about uh, routers that we make and uh, why we are making routers, how did we start making them, and uh, how open source makes our routers great, and uh, how open source is actually powering up our routers and what it allows us to do. So, uh, who we are? Uh, I'm from a company, it's called CZNIC, and we are actually a Czech top level domain registry. And uh, how did we get to making routers? Uh, we are actually doing uh, much more than just a registry. Uh, legally, we are some association of companies that actually compete with, with each other. So their only common goal is uh, to make working internet and uh, yeah, make the internet as best as possible. So we are run as a non-profit because that's the only thing that they agree on. And uh, we are making some open source contributions and we are making some open source software, especially when it is uh, connected to internet and making internet a better place. So we are developing BERT routing daemon that you might know. Uh, we are developing not DNS resolver and not DNS server, but we are also uh, helping to educate generic public in Czech Republic. We are uh, producing some books and uh, for example, we translated ProGit. Uh, we have a Czech author that is writing really great book about IPv6 and updating it uh, every few years, uh, depending on how IPv6 adoption proceeds. We even made a TV series uh, that explain people how to handle internet and that uh, they shouldn't trust everything, how they should uh, buy online and don't let scam and stuff like that. So we are trying to uh, do a lot of good in general and uh, at the end uh, we are making Wi-Fi routers uh, as part of that. So. Uh, apart from that, uh, we also run a Czech national CSERT team, which is a team of people that are monitoring uh, security threats and coordinating with ISPs and other similar teams around the world about security threats and yeah, security on the internet. Uh, that's going to get important as we go again, uh, as we go along. So, uh, how it all started? How did we get to making routers? Uh, we had this big question that uh, we wanted to have answered. Uh, how safe are the home users from network attacks? Is somebody attacking uh, network? Uh, uh, is somebody attacking home users? This average Joe that is just browsing YouTube, is he safe? Uh, how often is he attacked? Uh, what are the attackers trying to do? And uh, yeah, we had no clue. Uh, we know uh, what, uh, what is happening on our servers, but our servers are usually, they serve some purpose, so they have various services, and these attacks can be targeted at them, and uh, attackers probably learned about our servers from the services that they are offering. So, what happens with uh, average people at home? So we wanted to know that. And uh, so we started a project to actually assess uh, what's going on on the, on the devices that you have at home and that, are, that they are, uh, and that are facing the internet. So we created the first tourist router and goal wasn't to create a hardware router. The goal was to create uh, some uh, probe that we could give to people and uh, 
actually monitor the threats that are coming in. So we were researching how to do that, and in the end, we found out that uh, no device actually meets our requirements, so we had to create one. And uh, we created a first tourist router. We gave it for free in Czech Republic because it was financed from the money that we get for Czech domains. So we felt that uh, we should give it back to people who were buying the domains. And uh, since we were making router, uh, we decided to make it uh, as we thought that the routers should be made. So we created a way to propagate uh, security updates to the users, make it so that those updates will be automatically installed. But, uh, and we gave obviously people root account on their routers because it's a device that is running in their network, so they should be able to control it somehow. And uh, we had uh, just one condition on those people who were given the router, and that was that they will allow us to monitor some stuff and run some security research on top of those devices. And uh, one point was uh, that we were collecting firewall logs to figure out who's attacking them. And uh, optionally, we, uh, we allowed them to run some kind of honeypots. For some services, we have, we call it minipot. Basically, it's a service that opens up a port, for example, telnet port. And uh, when attacker tries to connect, it asks for credentials. And when attacker provides the credentials, it closes the connection. So it just collects the credentials that attackers are using to connect to telnet, HTTP, and stuff like that. And uh, we also allowed people to run uh, some uh, kind of honeypot. I will get to that later. And uh, hardware-wise, uh, we had dual-core, power PC, two gigs of RAM, and 250 megs of storage. So that was uh, something that we couldn't find in any router on the market that easily at that time. So uh, the result was that uh, we gave it to people. We run some security research on top of it. And uh, our CSET team guys were happy. They had plenty of data. They could do quite some research. Uh, they found some uh, ways of attack, uh, some new attacks. They found some worms that were going through the internet. And yeah, it was a great source of data. They were doing presentations around the world about what they found, and by the way, they were mentioning the project that we created. And uh, plenty of people were actually interested, uh, not only in the results, but also in the router, because they were saying that they would like to have such a router for themselves, a router that is quite powerful, can be made into doing quite a lot of things, and uh, with uh, root account, not having to figure out the way how to flash unoriginal firmware and losing warranty and stuff like that. So we were interested whether it's just our impression or whether people actually want such a device. And uh, we ended up uh, with Tourist Omnia, which was uh, our answer to that question. We created a router that uh, we wanted people to be able to actually buy because the first one was made from money for Czech domain, so we didn't want to sell it or give it to people abroad who never ever buy Czech domain. So we created a Tourist Omnia and we ran Indiegogo campaign to basically figure out whether people are really interested and we found out that they are interested. So we made it happen, and nowadays uh, you can buy it in normal shops. Uh, we made it even more powerful than the old router, and we tried to put everything interesting inside. So we have uh, RV7, 
2 gigs of RAM, 8 gigs of storage, uh, both Wi-Fi's 2.4 and 5 gigahertz AC. We put in SFP port so you can use fiber directly. We have some uh, mini PCI Express slots, MSATA, USB 3, everything. And uh, it ships with open source software. And uh, again, users get a root account and they can modify it. They can even refresh it. We have plenty of users that are not using our software, but their favorite distribution. And uh, we have normal screws. We are letting people open up the box. We are not voiding the warranty. And yeah, we are trying to be a good, uh, we are trying to be good. <laughs> so as we put everything in, uh, uh, we get get a feedback for Omnia, and the feedback was that uh, price tag between two and three uh, three hundred euros is quite high. That uh, who needs SFP? I don't have a fiber at home. Who needs Ethernet ports? I'm using just Wi-Fi. Uh, who needs Wi-Fi? I'm using only Ethernet ports. And uh, why just five Ethernet ports? I I have twenty devices. I need more. <laughs> And uh, why only two USB 3s? I have plenty of stuff that I need to attach. So, yeah, as you can see, those requests kind of conflict with, with each other. So we try to address all of those, and we came up with something new. And the new thing is called Tourismox. And we try to make everybody happy, again. And uh, we made it modular. So you have a base module that you can start with. It has RMV8, two cores, uh, some RAM and USB 3 and nothing more. And then you have uh, optional modules that you can buy and put it together like Lego and make the router that perfectly fits your needs. So that's how we got to producing the hardware. And that's uh, our latest step in producing hardware and trying to address people's needs. Uh, currently, it's uh, still on Indiegogo and should be available in retail probably beginning of the next year. So we were talking about the hardware. Now, what makes our router special? The, I would say that the most important stuff is that uh, we are using uh, free and open source software on those. You get uh, access to our repositories. You can take a look at the software. You can contribute back some patches. Uh, we also have quite enough resources, so you can run various services that you would like. There is plenty of uh, open source software available in our repositories, so you can install additional software. And yeah, you are running your average, well, you are running Linux distribution on your router, so you get all the advantages of that. Uh, main one being security updates. And yeah, because it's your device, you bought it, you deserve to have a root account on it, which is something that uh, nowadays vendors are trying to uh, make as hard as possible. And uh, since it started as a security research project, we still have some security features. And we are pretty open regarding everything. You get full schematics online. And uh, yeah, when we were running the campaign, it happened to us a few times that somebody asked some hardware question and it was late in the night, and before our hardware guys woke up and were ready to actually answer it, somebody figured it out from the schematics and answered. So, yeah. That's great. And uh, so I would like to speak more about the software and uh, show you a few examples of uh, what is really great and cool and what you can do with the open source software on your router. 
if you get some of the software is actually kind of limited that it needs powerful hardware as well. So, yeah. Uh, I will start from the Linux distribution that we are using. Uh, we are based on a distribution called OpenWRT. If you ever heard about it, it's a distribution that's targeting uh, embedded devices, but uh, most common use case is using it on routers. Thanks to it, it's optimized for small devices. Uh, packages are small, doesn't eat on much RAM. Uh, they have quite some, uh, quite some packages already prepared and uh, they have some extra functionality for routers. That's why we basically choose it. Uh, they, have, uh, they are doing a lot of uh, Wi-Fi development and testing some uh, firewall development as well. And uh, they have a nice uh, web user interface that you can con use to configure almost anything. Although sometimes it's, it can be quite confusing for end user because sometimes there is just too many options and you don't know what, what to do. And uh, their way of doing stuff, because uh, they are, their average target is a router that has something like 8 megs of storage, 8 megs of RAM. So they have to compress everything. Usually you get a highly compressed root FS and you will get something like 1 meg of storage extra that you will try to use for extra packages and configuration. Uh, we don't have to be that uh, restricted. So uh, our OS that is running in our routers is uh, based on OpenWRT. And uh, for our users, we created a much simpler web interface named Foris. It's trying to provide uh, basic and even some advanced functions in a simple way. So even average Joe can understand them and set it up. From the advanced um, functionality, one thing that uh, even I as an as a experienced user really appreciate is uh, OpenVPN server setup. If you ever tried to set up uh, OpenVPN, it's actually not that hard. Uh, just a few configuration options, but then the hard part is you actually have to create certification authority and create a certificate and somehow take care of that part. And uh, yeah, that's something that's hard to explain to beginners. So we integrate it into our web uh, interface and with few clicks you can create certification authority, create certificates for individual devices, enable OpenVPN server and uh, let your devices in. You just download the configuration file that has everything embedded, put it on your device and you connect. Another example, what we try to make the simple is create separate uh, SSID for Wi-Fi so people can get a kind of guest network for devices that they don't trust and give them internet access like IoT. And uh, yeah, because uh, we wanted to make it as simple as possible for people to use, we uh, spent some time uh, making sure that uh, we can update and uh, that those updates are, it is, that it is possible to install those updates automatically. So our users can enable automatic updates, set up their router and uh, that router will stay in the corner, work, sometimes get update, updates itself and then just send you email, hey, I just updated a few packages, there were some security issues, they are no longer there, you are protected. Uh, apart from that, uh, because we have much more 
uh, resources at our disposal. What we are also doing differently is uh, file system. We are not using heavily compressed uh, images with uh, some overlay on top. We have eight gigs uh, of storage on Omnia, so we can use uh, real file systems uh, for grown servers and desktops. So we picked uh, ButterFS because it's the coolest file system out there for Linux. And uh, it has some nice features that we are using. Uh, the most important one is uh, Snapshot. It's uh, really handy. And uh, we are doing snapshots all the time just to make sure that you have something to get back to if something goes wrong. Uh, we are making uh, snapshots automatically before each update. We are also making snapshots automatically once a week. And uh, we also wrote a simple tool that, will, that uh, can be controlled from CLI. And it will allow you to actually create uh, snapshots manually when you need to. For example, if you are uh, going to try to reconfigure your whole home network, you have you have been to some community meeting with uh, you been to some conference, uh, then you went with your friends to some pub, and when you get back from pub, you have this great idea how to reconfigure everything. So you can do you can create snapshot before you start. And then when you finally figure out that the idea wasn't really great and you no longer can connect to your device from any port, uh, you can just uh, press the reset button for long enough and it will roll back to the last uh, snapshot before the current stay. So it's really handy. <laughs> uh, and you can repeat that if your last state was broken already you can revert even more. You can compare the snapshots, take a look what what was there, and try to figure out what went wrong. So we think that uh, this functionality uh, is really handy if you are doing stuff with your router, and it's really important uh, that you have it accessible with uh, just one hardware button, and you are able to revert uh, roll back to the previous snapshot even if you cannot connect to the router. Uh, another thing that we can do, thanks to having uh, plenty of resources at our disposal, is Linux containers. Containers are also quite popular nowadays. And uh, what we are using them for is that uh, some of our users uh, really like the way their distribution work and they are really accustomed to their favorite distribution. So they prefer to run services uh, the way their distribution offers them. So if they want to set up some Tor or web server or IRC server or mail server or DNS server on their router, uh, they prefer to do it in their own distribution. So we are offering, uh, we have a, a LXC tools integrated. That's something that is uh, done on OpenWRT site already. Somehow we just uh, polished it a little bit and integrated it better. And uh, you can, with few clicks in web UI, you can install some Linux distribution into container. It will automatically get uh, its uh, virtual uh, interface assigned to LAN bridge. And uh, yeah, you can start using it. As I was saying uh, that we started from uh, Security research project. Uh, one part of the security research project that uh, 
was really interesting. And people ask us uh, for a long time. We actually split up from uh, the Tris uh, router project and created a separate project for it. Uh, this functionality is called Haas, Honeypot as a service. And basically the reasoning and how this works is Honeypots are cool and uh, you want to see and uh, lure the, those attackers to some honeypot and uh, see what they are trying to do and uh, yeah, make life a little bit harder for them, right? Uh, but uh, there's still some small risk that uh, they might actually escape from the honeypot, uh, depending on how well you manage it. And uh, even if they don't escape, uh, they might try to do something nasty in there. And uh, yeah, the average Joe wouldn't try to install Honeypot on his router. He would be scared. So there is an easy solution. Let somebody else run the Honeypot. And we would gladly do that for you. So uh, with this project, uh, you can register on our, on our website. You get a special token and then you download uh, just uh, proxy software. It is easily doable on our routers because we have it integrated very well. Uh, some distributions already have this uh, software packaged, so it might be available in your distribution and you can install it on your server as well. And after a little configuration, uh, when somebody tries to access uh, your device over SSH, this software will actually do man in the middle on him and send him to our servers and he will end up in our honeypot while thinking that uh, he successfully got into your device. And uh, you get all the output. You get to see what was going on. You get to see some statistics. Uh, you are completely safe. Nothing can happen to you. And uh, all those information actually go to our CSET team that also uh, does some research on top of it. And if they found something interesting, they let other CSET teams around the world know. So you are having fun and you are contributing to the general safety on the internet at the same time. Uh, I will show you how it looks. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, it's, it's big, is it big enough? Yes. Cool. So this is um, my honeypot uh, when I logged in. Uh, I have uh, various devices ha here, and uh, I picked my home router, and you can see who was trying to get in, whether they succeeded, and uh, what username, password they used, their IP addresses, where they were from, and at the end, uh, you see from which country I lured the most attackers. Looks like somebody in France has something against me. And uh, if you, uh, you can also click at uh, individual sessions and see what they were looking for. So this guy was looking for uh, some bitcoins. Uh, the other guy was just looking around and wanted to see what's, what's in there. And uh, even if you don't participate actively and uh, don't send us your logs so you can view it like this on the website, uh, we have some statistics that are available publicly. You can see how many people is participating, uh, uh, number of sessions and stuff like that. You can also download uh, the data that we collected anonymized so you don't know who was the guy that was attacked, but you know everything about the attackers. So if you are security researchers, you might want to take a look. And uh, we also have uh, 
the same map just from that data from everybody. So you see uh, that uh, people from France attacking my router is not that common and most of the time it's people from China and US. It's a just a specialty of my router that it's hated by, by French guys. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, one of the software that we developed, uh, we started, and uh, now we forked it, and now it's a separate project. Apart from that, uh, we are using uh, some software that other people developed, and we are integrating it to make sure that uh, it provides our users with some additional features and additional services that they might like. Uh, one of the projects that we are integrating is uh, called Suricata. And uh, that's helpful if you, are, if you need more than average firewall. It's an uh, intrusion detection or intrusion prevention system. Uh, it works somehow with network flows and it looks much deeper into uh, the traffic than your average firewall. It looks even into data and is able to understand uh, how protocols work and extract the data that are interested in some structured way. It can either lock the information or it can even in some setups uh, block the connections. It can alert you somehow and there is plenty of open source rules that you can download and try to integrate and you can write your own rules. Just a few examples, what it can do. Uh, nowadays, everything is encrypted. That would be nice, but it's not so. Uh, plenty of traffic is encrypted, but uh, what is usually unencrypted is DNS queries, which contains uh, quite some interesting information, like uh, or what server were you trying to address when you went to this public web hosting that contains thousands of servers? Or uh, even if you are establishing encrypted connection during the initial connection, you exchange some information, which usually contains the server certificate, which usually contains uh, the name that you were trying to access. And you also get some IP, MAC address, uh, length of connection, how much data was transferred, and stuff like that. So you can collect plenty of metadata about the traffic, even though if you, even if you can't get the actual traffic. So uh, what you can do that, uh, what can you use it for? You can monitor devices you don't trust figure out uh, what's your fridge doing when you are not home, what's your TV doing when you are not watching it, uh, where is it connecting. And uh, there is plenty of uh, open source rules that are trying to detect some of the suspicious activity, like uh, there are rules that are trying to match some known worms, there are rules that are trying to match some common uh, uh, this allowed behavior, like uh, if you are working in a company, it's uh, in some evil companies, it's disallowed to use IRC, disallowed to connect to Jabber, disallowed to use Dropbox, which I would maybe even agree <laughs> with, and stuff like that. So there are rules for quite some uh, events, and you can try to integrate them. Currently, we don't have anything uh, that advanced to make it easy, uh, but we plan to extend it at some point. Uh, just an example, what you can get from the encrypted communication. You have uh, no clue what's going on afterwards, but at the beginning, you know who issued the certificate, uh, what was it issued for, and stuff like that. So even if the connection is encrypted and you don't see actually HTTP headers, you see the certificate, which also tells you quite some information. 
and just some example how rules look like. And uh, yeah, I said that uh, Suikata is something that we don't develop. It's a separate open source project, but we like them and we try to integrate it. And uh, we integrated it and we created a software we call Pakon. Uh, it uses uh, Suikata currently just to collect the information about your traffic and figure out what was going on. And it can collect those information, aggregate it, and then you can watch it in either CLI or in simple web interface. And it can also alert you when a new device uh, shows up on your local network. So that can be handy if uh, you get an email if something new <coughs> is on your network and you have to figure out then by yourself whether it is the new fridge that you bought or whether it is your neighbor. So uh, just a small example. Uh, we actually created a demo web page, uh, demo.tourist.cz, that is actually showcasing our simplified web interface. Uh, it's uh, just static web pages, so you don't get to configure that much. But uh, part of it is uh, the OpenVPN configuration that I was talking about. It also has few options, but uh, mostly you just enable it, create certification authority, and then you just name the client, click create, and then get config for the client. And that's how you manage your certification authority. A little bit easier than OpenSSL. And uh, the stuff that I was going to show you right now is the Pakon. Uh, you can see what device was trying to connect. You can see where it was trying to connect. And uh, yeah, how much data it sent, received, how long it was there. And you can filter it by client or you can uh, filter it by the destination. So you can see who was using Facebook on your local network and for lo how long and how much data did they transfer. Or you can just select your TV and see where your TV is going, uh, what uh, website is your TV using. I found out that my TV really likes Baidu. I don't know why, but it's spending quite some time there. So yeah, it gives you more insight into what's going on in your home network. And uh, you might find uh, some devices that you might not want to trust anymore. So that's one of the examples of software that uh, there is a really great and big and powerful software that somebody else is doing and we just integrate it and give our users uh, plenty of advanced features. Other software that uh, kind of makes sense is, for example, Nextcloud. Uh, some people or some of our users were asking for it and uh, when you take a look at it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, if you are thinking about Nextcloud, you want to have your data secure. And uh, so you want to run the latest released version with all the fixes and all the security updates. That's what we are doing for our software. And uh, you want to make sure that your data stays private. So you want to host your next instance on infrastructure you trust. And yeah, we are kind of ultimate uh, self-hosting for that because it will be hosted in your flat behind your closed doors. And if somebody breaks up into your apartment, then probably he can get uh, much more valuable information than your next cloud. 
already. So yeah, it's a kind of natural fit. So we are working on that. Uh, as I was uh, speaking about our modular router, we created uh, one that has uh, four USB ports. Uh, one module with four USB ports, so you can attach uh, multiple hard drives and use it for, for example, Nextcloud. Uh, what we already have in place is EasyVPN, so you can connect uh, from anywhere to your Nextcloud instance. We have automatic updates, so you are always on the latest secure version. We even have uh, Nextcloud packages ready, and we have a CLI wizard that will guide you through setting up your Nextcloud instance. Uh, we still need to put it into simplified web UI. And uh, recently we also got uh, in our uh, web UI option how to format and mount a hard drive. It's uh, the first version of this plugin. Uh, we need to extend it to support RAID because if you are storing important uh, data on your router, you want to have a RAID on your router, right? So that's something that we are working towards to. Yep. Uh, quest, uh, question was uh, whether it will be hardware or software rate. Uh, we will be using software rate because we are using soft, uh, USB drives mostly. And what we are thinking about is uh, we really like ButterFS and ButterFS supports rate as well. So we are thinking about using uh, ButterFS rate. One of the uh, cool features of using ButterFS over classic uh, Linux RAID is that you don't have to have uh, drives with uh, same size and it will distribute the data and you don't have to think that much about uh, how you are doing it. Uh, with uh, not the same size drives, you can do it with, even with Linux RAID, but uh, you have to think about it and uh, make the partitions and mirrors and stuff. But with uh, ButterFS, it will do everything for you. So that's what we are looking for. Uh, that's what we are planning to use. And uh, one more uh, example of what people are actually doing with their routers. That is a little bit on the not that uh, obvious side is uh, there's this software called TV Head End that uh, you can install on our routers and people are doing it. Then you get a DVB-T dongle, put it into your router. You get a external hard drive, attach it to your router and then uh, you just turn your router into DVR. So you can record the shows on TV, you can stream your TV into your local network. And uh, another uh, software that we have available is mini DLNA. So you can even uh, uh, make the shows that you recorded available on your local network in a way that even your dumb smart TV understands. So that's uh, just uh, one example of uh, crazy stuff that you can do. Uh, there is much more software that is available and yeah, it's up to your imagination what you turn your router into. It's uh, just another device that is powerful. It's running 24 seven and can run any software you can imagine. So, Thank you for your attention. I have a few more pointers if you want to look some, uh, some stuff up. And now I would like to open uh, for questions. Thank you. Okay. Oh.
So how much of your work goes upstream and what's your experience trying to upstream? Okay, uh, upstreaming. Uh, yeah, obvious question and kind of difficult one uh, because nobody wants to speak about uh, what we didn't manage. Uh, Upstreaming uh, regarding Omnia, we managed together with some uh, community guys to get basic support in vanilla Linux kernel. So apart from uh, SFP and LADs, uh, you can get uh, your Omnia running latest vanilla kernel. Uh, regarding OpenWRT, the situation is a little bit trickier. Back then, uh, when we started, uh, they were still using SVN, and there were some discussions about that they don't like how they are doing releases. Back then, we forked them, and then they forked themselves. And uh, then they reworked how they are doing releases, and they reworked their, uh, uh, their version control system, and nowadays they are doing it in really great way, in a really sane way. So, but in the meantime, we actually released our devices. So we still have to maintain what we released. And we are now in process of uh, rebasing on top of a newer OpenWRT release. Now, the tricky part is that uh, we promised our users automatic updates that wouldn't break anything. So we need to make sure that uh, there is a smooth migration path from the old release to the new release. That's something that the OpenWRT doesn't have to. So yeah, we are trying to rebase on top of uh, the new release. And as part of that, uh, we are trying to clean up our patches and send as much as possible upstream. There is stuff that never will be upstreamed, uh, like, uh, some uh, customizations that we are doing because we don't have to care about size that much. We care about functionality more. So sometimes OpenWRT people are a little bit radical in cutting down the size. And uh, we are trying uh, to take a more conservative approach on that side. But uh, we are trying to upstream as much as possible. With, uh, yeah, but we are starting right kind of now. And we, are also, we also have to do support for the devices that we have out. And we are making a new device. But with the new device, situation is actually much better because we learned. And uh, if you take a look at... Uh, U-boot and uh, Linux mailing list, you will already see the patches going in for tourist mocks. And uh, we are building on top of latest U-boot upstream. And with the kernel, we are trying to stick with uh, 4.14, that is LTS that went to 18.06 open up reality. But uh, my colleague is sending patches to the latest uh, vanilla Linux as well, and trying to get upstream support for it as well. For customizations about OpenWRT, there's still quite some stuff that we have to go through and clean up and send upstream. But we are trying to work on it. Yep. So is it possible to um, deploy own applications on the router? De deploy your own applications on the router? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, with a few, yeah, you have to be aware of few things. Uh, first, it's, it's uh, ARMv7 or ARMv8, so different architecture than your desktop. So, depends on your favorite language. What's your favorite language? I like Python. If you like Python, yeah. then you are fine. Uh, okay. Because you don't have to compile binaries. And we actually have Python, and uh, in our team, we have plenty of people that love Python as well. So, uh, for example, the web UI that you saw is written in, in Python. And uh, 
our backend is written, I believe, in Python as well. So uh, scripted languages like Python or Shell are really fine, and you can install it uh, easily. When you get uh, into more troubles is when you try to compile something. Then you need to cross-compile it, and you either need to statically link it on your computer and copy the binary, or you have to use SDK from OpenWRT and try to integrate it with that. And then it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, because uh, not uh, sometimes, well, for the current releases that we have in 15.05, uh, SDK doesn't work uh, always, and especially as it is all the release, uh, it doesn't build well on new systems. So we are actually using some really old LTS on our build machine to be able to actually build for these old device uh, for for the old uh, tree that we have. So it gets a little bit tricky. If you are looking for the long-term window, the easiest way is to get your package into OpenWRT, into packages feed, and then we will compile it automatically when we migrate to 18.06. Okay, uh, another question? No more? Okay, so thank you again. And if you will think about another question later on, we have a booth in Menza area, and you can drop by, see our routers for ourselves, play Tetris on them, and ask us anything about them. Thank you. <laughs>